Hello, and welcome to Insightful Conversations with your host, Three Principles Practitioner, Del A.D. Jones. Join her each week as she welcomes some of the world's leading Three Principles teachers and practitioners who share how this understanding has dramatically improved the quality of their lives and the lives of those they work with. I'm so thrilled to have Terry Rubenstein with me today. Terry is the founder of iHeart and the co-author of the innovative iHeart curriculum. She is widely recognized as a leading thinker, educator, and speaker in the field of mental health and resilience. For over a decade, Terry has taught and impacted countless people through her uplifting trainings, seminars, writings, and online talks. Terry is the author of the groundbreaking Amazon bestseller, Exquisite Mind, How a New Paradigm Transformed My Life and is Sweeping the World, a book that tells the true story of her journey from years of suffering to mental wellness. She is also the author of The Peach Who Thought She Had to Become a Coconut, a series of essays on the power of thought and innate resilience. In her spare time, Terry is a mother to six beautiful boys and has recently become a grandmother. Welcome, Terry. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I have to say that I absolutely loved your book, um, The Exquisite Mind. Um, that was one of, one of the first three principles books I ever read, and it was, it was a beautiful story of your personal journey to mental well-being. And also, um, I love the peach who thought it should become a, po a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> Someone recently said to me, we loved, um, we have to read your children's book. Yeah. And I said, I haven't written a children's book. And they said, the peach you thought she had to be a coconut. And I said, it's not a children's book, but they just thought from the title that yeah. it was. So I know. It's so funny, actually, when I bought it, I thought the same thing, too. And then I read it and clearly it's not. But um, so, um, so tell me a little bit for, for our listeners, how, how you first came across the principles. Well, it was um, probably a, around a decade and a half now. I feel quite old. Um, and I had been through a particularly challenging time, which I write about in my book. Um, and just to make a long story short, um, coming out of a really serious depression and nearly losing my life, um, I, I had a very serious suicide attempt and I nearly didn't make it through. Um, but when I came out the other side, I, I kind of had an insight that I wanted to see if I could find my mental health. I knew that there were times in my life that I, that I lived with a high level of functioning. And I wanted to see if I could discover that again instead of going on a path towards medications and psychiatrists and, um, and, and other good things that were being offered me. Um, and through that time, I explored and I almost felt like a newborn baby that was learning how to walk and talk for the first time. It's almost like I didn't trust what I knew so far and I was ready to learn afresh. And I had a lot of self-insight. I read a lot of books, met some remarkable people. And I came out of those six months, because um, I gave myself six months time period in my mind, um, a different person. I, I kind of, for the first time, that, as far as I can remember, um, I felt a kind of deep sense of love for myself and I felt comfortable in my own skin and life just seemed simple and I felt grateful and all the burdens of the things I thought I needed to change to find peace of mind, like my personality, my past, my family, the country I lived in, my having a career, none of those had changed, but yet I had changed. And it was a year and a half later that I came across the principles. And when I heard about them, somebody had been to a conference and came back to London and was speaking about them. Um, they made sense because they spoke about something that was universally true principles for all human beings. And I knew that what I had uncovered, the insight I had, was I tapped into something that was about being human. It wasn't about Terry or her story or her circumstances. It was about discovering what is innate within all human beings. So when I heard the principles for the first time, they gave me the language and the context to talk about this and kind of make sense of it in a more cognitive way. Yeah. I love what you're sharing because I think sometimes people have the misconception that um, we teach the principles and you get the principles and now this can change your life. But mm -hmm. what, what you're pointing to is that the principles are happening whether we know about them or not. Exactly. And exactly. So that's that's a beautiful story. So obviously, um, well, I was going to, I was about to ask you, uh, you know, how the iHeart program came about, but I can see that your own struggle 
with with you know trying to find your mental health again. Um, you know, I I too had a, a very challenging teenage years and didn't want to be here for a while, and that's why I'm so passionate about bringing this understanding to to children or to to our teenagers. Um, so tell us a little bit about how what was your inspiration for the iHeart program. Well, I think after I discovered the principles, um, it became very intuitive for me, even though I'd never wanted to be a psychologist or a life coach or, you know, I'd been to many psychologists and, <laughs> and it was the last profession I wanted to enter into. But this was so alive and fresh for me and I felt it was something so simple that had to be shared with people. Um, and I really believed it could unlock suffering, um, especially for people who'd been looking at so many other theories and modalities as I had. So, um, so I started to share it under another charity, which was actually a Jewish organization. And I started to kind of just teach and start some classes. And there was nothing in, in the UK at the time and nobody else was sharing the principles. Wow. I traveled to the, to the US a few times. I met um, Sydney Banks, who was the founder of the principles, as well as a lot of the other pioneers. I became close to them. But in the early days, there was no one here in the UK, which is unbelievable to think of now. Mm -hmm. As it gained momentum, it grew into what we called the Nate Health Center. It became a center um, where people could come and learn in groups or one-to-one -one about these principles. And, you know, after many years of doing this and it kind of growing, and at this time, uh, you know, thank goodness I wasn't the only one. There were many excellent teachers here and practitioners in the UK. Um, I had an insight. I was, I was actually teaching a class of adults. There were about 30 adults in the class, and they were all talking about things they were grappling with, like anxiety around a deadline or a interaction with a colleague at work or just usual stuff. And while they were doing that, I kept thinking, when you were seven, you, you, the misunderstanding, the source of the misunderstanding, which is why you're grappling with this relationship now started, it began when you were on the playground and somebody rejected you and you felt that they hurt your feelings and you outsourced your well-being to them. And I could see that all of these started when we were kids and I felt we have to get to the kids. We have to get to the kids because by the time we're adults, we've been so conditioned to think in a certain way. Um, so let's start earlier. And that was really where the inspiration came. And almost at the same time, serendipitously, I was invited into a school to teach. We were asked to go into a secondary school, a high school here. Um, and we didn't have a program or anything. We just went in blind and kind of we, you know, we... I don't know how you said, we winged it, we, <laughs> we made it up as we were going along. Mm -hmm. But I realized at that time that we needed something clear that, that could kids could relate to. It wasn't like nebulous, that was very clear and articulate, it was engaging, it had the right pedagogy teaching style. And so we, with a big sigh, because I'd written two books and I know how much time it takes to put out something that's well-crafted and edited, um, I knew that this curriculum was going to be a major, major work project, but we, you know, thank God I had a, a great partner in crime, Donna Aronson, mm -hmm. and she she really pushed the project and she's been fantastic. So we kind of did it together. Mm. That's fabulous. I, uh, and it's so true. I mean, the, the, the reason why I became so interested in it was uh, the London conference last year. And um, I think it was Donna was up on stage and, and they she was also, they were talking about um, the the prison projects the um, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now but but there was different groups talking and they'd done all this research on it and and it became so clear to me again it's like why are we waiting until people have you know had a lifetime of struggle and and suffering and end up in the prison system or end up in the rehabs and and th places like that even though there's incredible work being done there but yes you're right if we can if we can reach our teenagers before they do look for those external, you know, ways to, to manage their stress and their, their suffering. So it's, it's a wonderful well, 100%. You know, I was in the, a classroom today. We just started a new project today, and I'll be in again on Thursday. And you see these young people sitting in front of you, and a lot of the schools that we're in are kids who are really struggling. They're either coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, one of the boys in the class, his brother was in prison. 
and you just see the beginnings. You see kids who are switched off from life, you know, for whatever reasons. You see the way they're interacting. I mean, it's just coping mechanisms that they've learned. And, you know, part of the inspiration of the iHeart is that it's a preventative program. So we want to go before this crisis. We feel let's educate young people so that when the challenges hit, they have the resources to be able to deal with them. Mm -hmm. They know how to come back and how to come back to themselves when they go off course. So I just feel like the messages that we're giving in the classroom are so essential and they're not the messages that the kid, these kids are hearing from other, you know, from other voices. They, they're hearing very different messages. So yeah. it feels good to be able to do this. No, and it's wonderful. And I love how, how structured the curriculum is because it's not just, you know, in a in sort of um, in a way in which it's easy to digest and understand by the students, but you also have to get into the school systems. You have to be able to present something to the to the you know the principals and the and the teachers so that they can understand what it is we're talking about. Because so often in the three principles, we're like, well, just say whatever's coming up in the moment and just go for yeah. the feeling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that 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 held us back for many years, and we were caught in that kind of you know maze of you know make it up in the moment and uh, you know me for myself I. I, three years ago, I started to learn about the principles from a certain teacher and I had a big insight and I saw that structure isn't a bad thing. In fact, structure is a very good and helpful thing. And if it's used correctly, it doesn't take away from spontaneity. It doesn't take away from inspiration. It just provides a clear direction and it, and it helps you build a logical picture mm -hmm. of something. And, and, and once I kind of saw that, it's almost like the structure and the articulation of, of, of this curriculum appeared. And, and I think it's beautiful. Today, I showed the kids, I showed them the whole layout of what we're going to cover from beginning to end. I showed them how each piece of the curriculum is another piece of the puzzle. And then it comes together as a whole picture. Once you have that whole picture, you see how does this apply now to this area of my life, this area of my life. But the structure is so helpful and the schools appreciate that. They love the professionalism of the program. They love the fact that it makes sense to them. We can, within you know, a 20 minute discussion with them, explain why it's so helpful, how it uncovers resilience in young people and why it has impact. Mm -hmm. And you know, and and that kind of clarity around the structure and the presentation of it is very, very much opens the doors for us into schools. Yes, but, I mean that's I'm I'm so excited that we're going to be bringing this training to to LA um, in April. We've been talking about it with Jeremy. So for people listening, can you just describe, um, like you just said, that you explain to the children what what each you know week, what each modular would look like, and how you bring it together? Can you just give that description for us, so anybody that's listening knows what what's what's what it involves? Well, we have like a foundation of about seven sessions, which we call our foundation sessions. You know, today I did um, the first session to, to this new group. And the first session is actually just called What is I Heart? Um, and how can it help me? And, and that session is very much just about presenting what I Heart is. We have an animation which shows an overview of it. Um, we, we show them um, an impact testimonial video of other kids who've done it and how they've benefited. We give them worksheets where they circle things they want to learn about. And we show them kind of an overview of the whole program. So when they go out, they feel like, yes, we know what this program's about. Um, by the way, the program's been updated already five times, and I'm doing a major update this, this term. And it's all based on the feedback that we see. If I feel like certain parts of the program are making impact or the kids are switched off and it's not so easy to switch on kids when you're going into a classroom situation, they're not like adults who've come and said, please teach me. So it has to be super engaging and, and feel like it's relatable to them. So that's a constant um, progression for me um, in, in terms of constantly updating the curriculum. And then the next, the next sessions are really showing them how our psychological system works, showing them how the mind works, showing them the inseparable connection between thought and feeling, showing them the innate qualities that we have inside of us already, explaining why we don't always access those qualities, why they sometimes feel out of reach, but also showing how they always there and they can never be damaged, lost or broken. You know, we've got a whole session on those qualities. We've got a whole session on the inseparable connection between thought and feeling. We've got a whole session then on the power of thought 
um, thought as a power, as a constant. We've got a session. So we're slowly building all the blocks of how this incredible intelligent psychological system that we kind of born with and born into, how it works. We show the logic of that. We show the logic of how it doesn't work. We don't expect the children to buy into that. We get them to test it out for themselves. All along, they're playing with the material we're giving it. They're proving it. We've got proof it's all the time um, so that they can really challenge it. We give them opportunity to challenge it. At the end of each session, they fill out a form saying what they agreed with, what they didn't agree with, anything they didn't like, a question they have. So they get to really give us the feedback after each session. And once we've done those foundation sessions, we then go into, well, now that we understand how the mind works and how it doesn't, let's look at how this relates to exams and stress. Let's look how this relates to using social media without it using you. Let's look how this relates to appreciating difference. Let's look at how this relates to um, self-image and identity. We call that labels off the jars. Let's look how this relates to habits and compulsions. Let's look how this relates to dissolving the barriers to learning and motivation. Those are all different lessons we've got. Mm. Um, they kind of are implicational, the practical kind of part of it. Mm. So that's, that's how the, and by the time they're in those sessions, they're really engaged with the learning by that time, because it's almost like the logic of the principles has, also, has been kind of laid out for them. Mm. And it's kind of theirs to play with. Yeah. So... I love that. That sounds so exciting, and I love how interactive it is too. And and they have a they have a real part in in how the you know t like you say, seeing it logically that it's not something they just have to s sit and listen to and be taught and told to believe that they actually get to interact and and prove it for themselves. And um, the other thing I I wanted to ask you is um, some of the success stories because I know that for the last is it the last couple of years you've ha you've had a, a company that actually um, is doing research on C can you explain more about that so no, the research has been a very big um, area of growth for us and a challenging area for us there have been a lot of challenging areas so you know this this has been a in the, probably the most challenging thing I've ever done in the last 15 years of this work because it's one thing to know your craft or have been kind of not an expert, but really know what you want to teach and share. It's another thing going into the world of education, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the world of young people. That wasn't our area. So we have to get very upskilled in that. And then the other thing we had to get skilled in, and we have a lot of advisory boards, is the research element, because it's very well for us to say we think our program's fantastic, but people want to see evidence that it works. And we want also that evidence because we want to see it's working. Otherwise, why are we doing it? You know, we're a nonprofit, so we exist to create impact, not to make money for ourselves. So if we're not making impact, then, you know, that's not good. So, um, so the research has been a constant um, learning curve for us. And we have always evaluated from the very beginning our programs. And the kids always do a pre-evaluation and a post-evaluation. And that data has been analyzed, some of that data, by analytic companies. And we've also got um, qualitative questions we ask them. We have three strong questions at the end. And we also take some video testimonials. Um, but we actually needed to get to the next level of research. And we recently won a a grant from the National Lottery. Um, they actually want to help us develop some of the weaker points of iHeart, one of which is the research, because they want us in nine months' time to apply for their big grant. They've got a, a, a very, very large grant that you get over three years. Um, and one of the areas they identified that they wanted to help us strengthen was research. Mm -hmm. So they gave us a grant, you know, a, a good amount of money, and we've now teamed up with an organization called YouthSat, which has the biggest database of young people, I think, in the world. It's like 250,000 young people are on their database, so they can do control groups and all kinds of things. And today, for the first time, we went in, and instead of having paper evaluations, mm -hmm. they've given us um, um, tablets. Mm -hmm. And each child had a tablet, and it was uploaded, the survey, they filled it in, and it goes straight through to youth site, and they're going to, over the next six months, I think it's about, I don't know if it's 500 or seven, five to 700 kids, they're going to analyze that data for us um, and do control groups. So it's going to be a very, very well-researched um, piece of work, this next term of, of iHeart teaching, which is fantastic. Mm. That's wonderful. Can you give us some of the statistics? I know that areas such as bullying and um, 
um, even even um, just the the results within their schoolwork I know have improved and interpersonal relationships. Can you tell us a bit more about that? I don't at the moment in front of me just because, but some of that is available on our website. If people want to look on the I Heart Principles website, we have published that. I don't have the figures in front of me, um, but for sure we have seen, um, you know, some very, very promising initial, initial results. You know, there was a school that we've worked in. Um, one of our, our practitioners, um, John Scott, worked in a PRU unit. So it's basically a unit that um, children who've been um, expelled from school, they've been kicked out of school because of behavioral issues. Instead of kind of as one step away from going into juvenile detention or prison, they go into the school. And um, John worked there and he did incredible work with them. We actually now are gonna be working one day a week in the school for the next three years. Because the ma there's a mayor of London called the Young Londoners Grant. And we got it, it was a very big grant. And we get to work in three schools over three years in these three schools and this is one of them. And um, they did their own metrics. They've got very, very substantial metrics they have to do because of government funding. And they found that the AHA program had significant, significant results and also the level of attendance because these kids don't pitch up at school. They just go missing. The level of attendance, the level of being able to just be in an interaction without getting violent, um, a whole bunch of, you know, kind of metrics in terms of behavioral metrics that were very, very powerful, which is why they wanted us, they kind of co-went for this grant with us because they, they wanted us to continue, they want to embed it in the whole school. So we have had um, in certain schools, and particularly quite interestingly in schools where the children are really struggling even more than when they not so much, mm -hmm. um, very, very promising initial results. So, yeah, that's wonderful. I, I was sharing with Jeremy that you know one of the one of the things that we deal with here in America is, you know, when I first moved here or when my children were young, they w we would have earthquake drills. I'm in California, so it would be you know how to deal with an earthquake. Mm -hmm. And now, what is so tragic is they teach our young children in schools how to deal with a mass shooting. Uh, yeah. how to you know lock down protect yourself what to do in that situation and i mean i know as a parent th the stress that that puts on you as a parent to wonder if it's ever going to happen in your school and i just feel very strongly that if 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 this was taught in our school systems there would be a dramatic decrease in that type of violence and the stress as i say that the other children are having to endure knowing that you know, we just had one in California in Los Angeles a couple of months ago. Um, you know, everybody's it's like it's not um, if it could happen in your school; it's when it's going to happen in your school. Is the is the general attitude now, which I think is so so painful. Yeah, it's interesting because recently in the class, um, I asked one of the students to come up and volunteer. It was actually a stress session. So they kind of um, come up with a balloon and we do a whole thing on the, on the poster on the board and I asked him for the example, an example that makes seems to make him feel stressed. And he chose um, terrorism because, mm. you know, it's also quite like on kids' minds here in London. Mm -hmm. You know, there was just recently another mm -hmm. um, terror attack on London Bridge. And, um, and we put it on the chart, because that's what we do. We put it on the Our Heart poster. And, you know, I said something to the children. I think they were quite shocked that I said this. I said, but, you know, how do we learn how to deal with the fact that we don't live in a world that's guaranteed safe? It's not, you know, there, there are dangers and there are things that could go wrong. There are shootings, there are terrorism acts. So how do we find well-being in the face of that? Mm -hmm. You know, because, and I think that that's what's so nice about this learning is it's not trying to cover over the fact that there are difficult things to, to deal with in life, but it's saying that we have the resources within to deal with them mm -hmm. and that those things aren't going to break us or damage us that they can't touch our well-being because that's sacrosanct, that's whole, um, that's, you know, it's, it's kind of off limits. And, and I think like that's such an important thing to teach our children because the opposite what, you know, kind of a lot of what they're learning around resilience is um, kind of pad yourself up in cotton wool and make sure that no one says anything mean to you and nothing terrible happens and et cetera, and that's how you'll stay safe. And, and that's just not realistic and that's not life. 
you know, so I, that's, I just, I always feel like this is so important for kids to learn this and be re-educated in this way. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and also what, what um, I'm noticing too with our youth today that, that, you know, when, when I was growing up, it was, um, I just took it for granted that we would have a healthy planet to live on and I'm going to have children and, and, and be a grandmother one day. And, and now I'm realizing that there's a younger generation that, that um, are living with the stress of the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And again, how to, how to proactively work within that with resilience. Yeah, and absolutely. There's a lot that the youth of today are facing, just even, you know, the whole virtual world that we live in. It's like before, if you were struggling with dynamics with your friends, you kind of left it at the end of the school day and you kind of could go home and relax. Now it's in your home. It's everywhere. So you can't escape it. So there's a way that that's why it's so kind of incumbent on us to help these kids uncover more resilience so that they can deal with life as it is in the you know the 21st century well um i think you're doing amazing work and i'm so thrilled to um to hopefully bring this over help bring this over to the los angeles area in april april 6th through april 10th so anybody that's listening to this show and are interested please contact the the website um can you give your website again the iheart website Yes, www.iheartprinciples.com. Okay, wonderful. Um, and um, yeah, we'd love to bring it to America. It definitely seems to be hitting the right spot, I think, in the UK and in other countries, in New Zealand now and in Scotland and in South Africa. And we were just, um, I just did a workshop in Israel. We've got a whole sign up to start iHeart Israel, yeah. Scandinavia. I think it's hitting the right messages because people want something that we call it rethinking mental health, a new language, something that focuses on mental health rather than mental illness, something that goes to the source of the problem that's not superficial, that's really, really tackling, going deep into the problem, but offering a solution, something that's preventative. Um, and for me, it's, it's such a hopeful um, message and such a hopeful learning for, for young people. So we'd love to bring it to America. It's one of my favorite places, America. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I look forward to meeting you in person soon. As well. Thanks for having me, Del. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.